Hi, I'm Scott Thomas, and I'm here with Neetu Elizabeth Simon, and we're going to be talking about how to combine a really, really old-fashioned machine with artificial intelligence. So uh, first, we'll start off with a sleeping aid from our legal department, and we also included some uh, very specific instructions on exactly what devices we used so you can replicate these results if you need to. Now, our project objective was not to deploy thousands of factories. It's just to show Intel's customers how to do this. We work for Intel. Intel does not sell final solutions, but we do help our customers to sell final solutions, or as we call it, market-ready solutions, or MRS is for short, because everything at Intel is a three-letter acronym. I'm going to start with the hardware design and how we integrated our computer with the machine. But first, we have to cover briefly what the textile industry looks like. Every one of these thousands of threads has to work. If one of them breaks, everything manufactured from that moment on is defective. The margins are very tight. They can't afford a lot of defects. So they have to watch it very closely. And this is the state of the art of textile inspection. This poor woman stands there a maximum of two hours a day because you're brain dead by the end of two hours. They have to switch very frequently or else they miss defects. This is ripe for some automation. These are what defects look like. This is what our system needs to find. I started with a hardware that's the old fashioned textile machine. It's just a motor and some basic controls. And a, I added the image capture equipment and the machine controller. Neetu did all of the real time inferencing and compute. And we had to work together to make the system work together so that her machine could control my machine. First, all the developers are ready. All the software people are ready to get started, but I had no data. They had nothing to in, start their inferencing models against or anything. So I just brought one of my SLR cameras from home and took pictures of fabric stretched over a LED light for a ceiling tile. It was good enough. We just had to get data so that they could get started and we could get going. Once I got the developers off my back and gave them some data so they could get developing, I had to get a hold of a fabric machine. So we just ordered an off the shelf machine. It's very simple. Came with a series of its own problems, but uh, it was really cheap. And uh, already done, proven engineering. In this picture, the operator stands behind the machine. You could not see that operator in the back. The fabric is stretched up the back in front of these three cameras. These are little white boxes here. These are cameras and this is a lighting system. And the fabric goes up over the top then in front of the operator. That's the way it works. Now, we put the cameras on the back so that the defect could be found and then shown to the operator on the other side. That's why we designed it that way. The physical design, this is a top-down view, not from the back. This is from the top down. The operator's head is over here somewhere looking at the fabric. And the cameras are over here. It's about two meters of fabric that we had to view. And we needed about four pixels per square millimeter. So we engineered it that way. Four pixels a square millimeter. The camera design backs itself out. There was a thought to use a higher resolution camera with just a, a big fisheye lens to cover the whole thing but that causes pincushion distortion, which can be corrected, but it's just a can of worms. We needed it quick, we needed it now, simple. This is how we deployed it. Now to get it integrated with uh, Neetu's machine, I added an Arduino. The project manager said, I need it cheap, I need it quick. What's that? If you're an engineer, that's Arduino. So I just added a, a relay to the Arduino. The Arduino controls the relay with five volts. And the machine is up to 380 volts and we had terrible wiring diagrams. They had no idea how this was wired. So I selected relays that were good for up to 380 volts. Turns out it was just 24 volt control voltage, but still we were ready for anything because we didn't know what we were gonna get. I recommend in the future that you use a programmable logic controller that's more money. It's not quite as simple to program, but it's much more robust. Now we had a lot of problems. You can imagine there was color tint from the, uh, uh, from the cameras. We didn't bother fixing it. We just trained with the color tint. If it's all the same, it doesn't matter. The training model doesn't know it's ugly. Uh, poorly documented machine wiring, like I said. Also, they didn't wire it according to their own drawings, so it caught fire as soon as we plugged it in. That was exciting, but once the adrenaline wore off, it worked. Um, <clears throat> also, we brought SSDs from the United States, and they did not work for the computer in China that we met with our manufacturer, and it didn't work with their computer. Neetu had to completely start over from scratch with a really bad network connection. Finally, though, it did come together in the end. Uh, this is my uh, 
Arduino board and relays, three stack light system, and we got a simple USB RS-232 interface to get Nitu's system attached to mine. And it finally worked at the end, what a relief. Next, Nitu, we'll talk about software. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so I'll cover the software design uh, implementation and the challenges. So any AI machine learning solution development goes through these four uh, uh, stages. Uh, it's a cyclic iterative process. As Scott mentioned, we had used the Basel camera for data collection. Uh, it came with a pylon software package, which is open source for uh, data collection and pre-processing. Uh, for annotation, we use the OpenVINO computer vision annotation tool. Uh, this helped us in annotating or labeling all the data as good and bad. Uh, for training, we use the TensorFlow Keras libraries. And for uh, the inferencing, we use the Intel uh, Advantech IPC Core i5 machine, which was actually running this OpenVINO toolkit for inferencing, uh, the controller code, which was mentioned by Scott, and the Edge Insights platform for data collection and uh, processing. Next slide. So this uh, slide shows you the practical implementation of our solution. Uh, the uh, fabric here is directly from the factory. All these fab fabrics were defective pieces and they had uh, defects in each uh, frame actually. So for annotation, uh, we basically had to crop uh, out the uh, good images from there. We use both binary classification and multi-classification here. Uh, with binary, we had classified them as defect and good. For multi, we decomposed this defect class further into discoloration and weft. Uh, the examples is actually shown here in the image of what a discoloration is or a weft is. Uh, training, with respect to training, we got very good accuracy for both um, uh, for the binary classification process. And the live inferencing, you can see the entire setup. Uh, it was running very well. And the accuracy we got was also pretty good, uh, around 99%. The uh, model trained on the white fabric also worked with the green fabric. Um, but the multi-classification accuracy was very bad uh, in both uh, these cases. Next slide. So now I'll cover the challenges and the learnings uh, from the software perspective. Uh, so the network, as Scott mentioned, was very, very slow. Both Ethernet and Wi-Fi was very, very slow. Uh, so we couldn't do any training there. Uh, and we had to send all our data back uh, to our team in the US who actually trained these models and then send those out to us for uh, inferencing for the next uh, day. Uh, also, since the network was very slow, the dockers were taking a lot of time to build. Uh, so we had to individually download these packages through the VPN and then had to build the Docker con containers using offline uh, installation of these packages. Next slide. With respect to data collection, uh, we had to get some domain knowledge about what a defect is in a textile industry. Um, there was a library available online, uh, which explained what are the different kinds of defects and how to distinguish between a good and bad frame. Um, also, uh, all the, like I mentioned, all the defects, uh, all, the, uh, all the fabric had defects in them. So technically all the frames had defects in them. For good data, we had to crop the image and then we had to resize them for uh, training purpose. And we believe this uh, would have resulted in the bad accuracy that we got with the multi-classification process. We did use some augmentation techniques to increase the data set. Uh, but it also resulted in generating more erroneous data, uh, which could have also impacted the accuracy. Next slide. So the model worked, but uh, it was not scalable enough. So that means that the model which we trained on the white fabric, it worked on the cream fabric, but it failed to work on the brown fabric. Um, so it was not a scalable model that we had. Also, it worked for simple fabric, like simple patterns and colors, and it would uh, fail if the pattern is more complex. Uh, model was also very, very sensitive to folds and creases. And uh, also because of the slowness of the network, our, our team in uh, US had to train these models. Inferencing was very good. We got a 30 frames per second average inferencing speed. What we noticed is as the motor speed increased, the frames started to drop. Uh, so our system was not robust enough to handle this high motor speed. Next slide. 
So that ends our presentation. Uh, thank you and uh, let us know if you have any questions.